right. Good evening, everybody. So I think we've got, um, you guys know we're going to do a Q&A tonight. And um, I'm wondering if we have somebody to run a mic. Is there somebody who can run? There we go. Mike's in the back. So if you guys have a question, just uh, raise your hand, and Mike and Britton will bring you the mic. And uh, what I love about Q&A is not only we don't, we don't know where the conversation is going to go, we also, it's just fun hearing what's on your heart and what's on your mind. So the, the time is yours. Is this on? Nope. Oh, there we go. Are you all ready? <laughs> okay. Of course, we're always ready. Okay, first question then. Um, so, you know, we are called to live lives that are blameless before the world so that they may not blaspheme God. But um, if we have, you know, like because we are sinners, we sin in front of non-believers and um, otherwise kind of tarnish our testimony, how honest can we be about like our sins before non-believers, especially in testimony? And if we have like, you know, un unintentionally or, you know, done something to see, make it seem like our testimony or our God is invalid even though he certainly is not, then how would you go about like continuing to testify toward those who know your like sin? Carol, let's see. This one on Vox One, I think. Checking Vox One, yes. Thanks, Dustin. Carol, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's something of a foreign language in the unbelieving world when a Christian understands their sin as an offense against a holy God vertically, and then an offense against someone horizontally. I don't know if you've had the experience of trying to explain to an unbeliever, I've sinned against you, will you please forgive me? Um, I, I think it's really good to be transparent about that. Um, we, I think we make the mistake when we think unbelievers are supposed to look at us and Jesus said in Matthew 5, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven. So I better not let unbelievers see anything that's not good works because then they'll get the wrong impression. And I think the opposite is actually true. One of the lights that a Christian is is a profound humility that assesses my own sin that recognizes the reason that I just did X, Y, Z in a way that offended an unbeliever is because I'm, I'm actually a sinner. I... I, I sin against God and against others. What the world is not accustomed to is an honesty about what sin is. Um, not just the outward deed, but the unearthing of the heart motivations that drove it. Um, and then to confess those things to an unbeliever. It, in one sense, it's a foreign language. In another sense, it's evangelism. Number one, it's the right thing to do before the Lord. Um, but secondly, it has a, a remarkable effect. Um, when I've had the opportunity to do that, I'm not suggesting go out and sin against all your unbelieving neighbors, but, but whenever you do, take the opportunity to confess that sin. Talk about who has paid for their sin and then demonstrate what it looks like to reconcile horizontally. Um, and, and I remember when I've had opportunity to do that, uh, unbelievers have looked at me and, and you know, pat me on the head and say, oh, no, no, you're not that bad. No, 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 it's not all as bad as you say. Oh, no, it's much worse. Um, and it really becomes an opportunity not only to do what's right, um, but also to, to put on display before the world something they're just not accustomed to. Uh, taking ownership for your sin and then finding your hope and joy in a substitute who paid for it. Frankly, that's the only hope that, a, that an unbeliever has too. Um, and a Christian has a, has a handle on what sin is in a way that an unbeliever doesn't grasp yet. So I would just encourage you to confess your sin before an unbeliever. Watch what happens. By the way, I mean, if you have kids, you, you do that at home all the time. You should. April and I are always talking about the opportunity we have to model the gospel. Hopefully, I mean, we're gonna, we, we know we've modeled the gospel in negative ways. Whenever we've sinned against the Lord in front of our kids, it's an opportunity to say, hey, mom and dad need Christ just like you do. And so you're confessing uh, who you are, and you're, you're helping them understand the difference between um, righteousness and, and who we are by nature. And then you're hoping that they also see the gospel in your victories. 
in that you actually do live a different life. And uh, so this, it's, that's true, you know, with, with your unbelieving friends that um, it's, it's not, you shouldn't, you shouldn't worry that a sin against an unbeliever um, undoes the gospel. And an unconfessed sin, as professing to be a Christ, if you don't confess that sin, undoes the gospel. Um, so you're, you're actually um, helping them, you know, like when, when, when John writes, I write these things to you so that you might not sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so he's writing about, this is how you have power over sin. But when you do sin, here's your advocate. So I, I view it in this way, um, Carol. I try to think, when I sin against somebody, I want to go, in, in, I, I want to I clear that up in their mind. I want you to know that what you just saw is not Jesus Christ. You, you know that I'm a Christian. So what you just saw right there, that wasn't Jesus Christ coming through. That was John Anderson coming through. So please know the difference and forgive me for sinning. And uh, this is my hope. So you're kind of like, it's an opportunity to explain what you're trusting in. But you're also making it clear in their mind where that sin came from. It wasn't, that had nothing to do with Christ. That had to do with me, the sinner. And, and that's actually what Smith is describing there as the evangelistic opportunity, um, when, which is probably offensive in the fact that you're even seeking someone's forgiveness. But that starts to clarify for them the gospel. And John, just to follow up on that, what are the consequences if an unbeliever sees you sin, knows that you sinned, um, and you don't confess it, but you go to church and you put on the you yeah. know, deal? Yeah, yeah. Then, <laughs> then you're you're preaching. Well, you, you're if, if you're if you're genuinely not aware of your sin, um, and you're or if you're if you're aware of it and you're saying nothing about it, then you are actively promoting hypocrisy. Um, and so that's that's what your unbelieving friend's going to see is the profession, all this religion, all these externals. But then they know what you do in in your heart and in the way you live your life, and it's like, nah, he's no different. And uh, so it really that's that's really what undermines the gospel. Is not, not the sin, but the lack of confession, lack of brokenness. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Dustin, don't you have your own microphone back there? Can't you just like chime in whenever you want? <laughs> you could have just started talking without the microphone. You'd be like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just because I'm back here doesn't mean you get away with it, uh, not asking questions. So. So much so, I have two questions from the same passage, uh, Ephesians 4, um, 7 through, I guess, 12. And I'll give you a little bit of time to get there. Um, but he basically goes through saying, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is Ephesians 4, 7. And he says, therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also. He who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. So I guess the first question is, why this particular quote um, in verse 8? Why, why mention this, the host of captives? And the second part of that question is, what does verse 9 mean? You know, this descending into the lower parts of the earth. Yeah, that's a, this is an interesting passage because, you know, Paul, Paul here is quoting from Psalm 68. And it's interesting that he actually, uh, which is really important, by the way, when you see the Old Testament quoted in the New, you, you want to make sure that you go back and study the Old Testament passage and then look at what the original author is, is saying and doing. And then go, when you go to the New Testament passage, that's going to help you understand what's, what, what's the New Testament author saying? What, what point is he proving here? And in this particular instance, what's so fascinating about the quote from Psalm 68 is that Paul actually makes a change. Uh, he actually changes a verb. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. It's pretty fascinating what he does here. In fact, you, I'll try to do this with one hand here so I can keep Ephesians 4 open. Look at Psalm 68 for a second. So it's in verse um, 18. Um, 
And let's just go back to verse 15. We'll read verses 15 to 18. Let's read this whole, whole paragraph here, this little stanza. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with envy, O mountains, with many peaks, at the mountain which God has desired for his abode? Surely the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. You have ascended on high. You have led captive your captives. You have received gifts among men even among the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell there. And so this is a picture, this is kind of a Zion-type moment in the psalm, where the psalmist is explaining um, the thrill that where God dwells is going to be a location of envy for all these other locations. So God's going to take up residence in verse 16, residence of, uh, there in Israel, and then it evokes the imagery of, of Mount Sinai, thousands upon thousands. These are the holy ones, the angels. Uh, they were there at the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And so it's evoking the same imagery of Sinai. So God's presence, God's revelation, and all these holy angels. Well, in, in that context, you now have God himself, the Lord, ascending on high, leading captives, all these captives. And what's critical here is that these are the rebellious also. The last phrase says, even the rebellious also. So it's kind of like, Whoever dwells there, you're either, you're either dealt with or you're actually converted. <laughs> so everybody is made um, adequate to dwell with God in God's presence. And the gifts here are specifically God receiving gifts. Okay, did you notice that phrase in 18? Did you notice how Psalm says, Psalm 68, 18, the middle phrase says, You have received gifts among men. Okay, so now let's flip over to Ephesians. And in Ephesians, he says, uh, gave. I'm trying to get there so I can just read it and not paraphrase it. In verse 8, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Okay, so now the picture here is... Um, in a context where Paul has been talking about this diversity among unity. And so just to, not to preach a whole sermon here, but just look at the context for a second. Um, verse 4 through 6 talk about unity. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called in, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. There's the, there's the unity in verses 4 through 6. The diversity is introduced in verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So the issue is Christ giving gifts. And what's fascinating then is he goes to Psalm 68, which is a profound psalm about uh, Yahweh, about the Lord himself, ascending in triumphant fashion over all his enemies and even those who are rebellious. And in the context of Psalm 68, receiving gifts as a triumphant victor. Now here in Paul's analogy, in Paul's uh, treatment of the gifts given to the church, he's giving gifts to men. So you can see what's happening here. He's not changing the meaning of the psalm. He's not correcting the psalm. He's just putting an emphasis on something that's, that's also, also a reality. If in Psalm 68 the imagery is Christ as the victor, and all those rebellious people are gifts to the conquering king. Here Paul is showing that he even gives his converts who come from darkness into light. He gives them back to the church. And so those who are now given to the people who are dwelling in his presence are gifts to the welfare of that whole organization. So then he goes through and starts walking through what it looks like to be part of the church. Um, and uh, that he's going to even equip the saints and grow the church through the, gifting pe the gifted people in the church. So giving gifts to men here, the gifts are actually the formerly rebellious people who are converted and given to the church. So it's, 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 um, it's right to say in some of those gift lists, it's talking about an actual function like hospitality, and leadership, and teaching, and all those kind of things. Here, the gifts are the people. Because he gave some gifts, namely, when he starts to get specific, verse 11, he gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, he gave some evangelists, 
some pastors and some teachers. And so he's not describing like um, skill sets so much as people. And so that's who he gave back to the church as a gift. So I like, I think what's profound about this is how Paul uses that, the profundity of what's happening in Psalm 68 and says, it's exactly what's happening in the church. Christ is victorious and he's giving back conquered former rebellious people to his church. And that's actually a part of the diversity among the unity of the church. So is that helpful? And is that, and I'm, I don't know if I'm assuming too much about the, but usually when you read Psalm 68, you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> you just changed the verb. It goes from giving to receiving, or sorry, from receiving to giving. So that's usually, that's what's happening there, I believe. No, yeah, that was, that was very helpful. And that provides a lot of insight to that first question. There's a second one. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, just that, that mentioning of the dissension. I was wondering if you could touch on that as well. The ascension. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended um, into the lower parts of the earth. Um, are you asking, does that mean uh, the, the grave or hell or just to earth itself? Is that your question? Like where is the descent? Or I mean... I'm supposed. I, I could probably guess one of those, but which one is accurate? Maybe, is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is what does that mean yeah, yeah. there? I take it as grave, um, uh, which implies incarnation and death. I don't take it as uh, the the pit of hell, um, but some do take it that way. But I just take it as uh, incarnation and death, uh, which is contrasted with the ascension in victory. That's helpful. Thank you. My question comes from Jude, um, starting with verse 5. I guess it's more like verse 6, but... Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And then verse 6 says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains until gloomy darkness, until the judgment of the great day. And I guess what I always thought was those angels that he's referring to were maybe demons and those that were with Satan. And I thought that they were still roaming around the earth and um, being involved in, um, I don't know if you want to say hindering or, or doing their work that they're supposed to be doing or trying to hinder or whatever. But this says something different, so... Yeah, Dana, thank you. The, the, the demons described here are a subset of the totality of demons. When we find out that Satan is an angelic being who is like a lion roaming the earth seeking whom he may devour, he's not locked up. But, but these ones are. These ones are locked up. So what we know in Jesus' day in, in his earthly ministry, there were demons that were roaming about, uh, tormenting people, etc., uh, demonic activity is present to this day. This is a subset of the demonic population. Um, and notice the, notice the activity that they did, that they, um, they did not keep their own domain, but they abandoned their proper abode. God has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And notice the connection to verse 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Um, there's a connection to the going after strange flesh. And John's going to be glad to explain why these demons got in trouble. <laughs> Was that a good lead in? <laughs> I thought you were joking about that whole part about uh, leaving all the difficult questions. <laughs> no, that's, but well, it's, it's true though. I mean, um, you know, there, there's very, there's a lot of difficult passages that, you know, come up. One, probably the, the most prominent one would be Genesis 6, and there's going to be a lot of different views on Genesis 6 when Moses describes the sons of God and the daughters of men. Um, one of the views of that passage would be that there was actual immorality existing between 
you know, uh, angels and, and women. Um, and that sounds so impossible to get our minds around. But when you get right to it, this passage actually does, like Smith pointed out, this, there's, a, there's a just as here. There's a comparison. And the comparison is between Sodom and Gomorrah and what these angels did. And it says, just in the same way as these in indulged in gross immorality. And so, uh, regardless of what you do with Genesis 6, I don't think you can just, you know, throw out the uh, explanation of what, of what Moses is doing there as though that's an impossibility. Because clearly that's a reality. That, 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 that happened. Uh, we can say that that happened through past tense. Um, however, what you, don't see, what you don't see a lot of in Scripture is a lot of description about that continuing to happen or warnings about it happening currently. What, what you do see in scripture about the, the threat of demonic activity against the church is, is uh, just any, any form of doctrinal confusion and any form of moral uh, infidelity. Um, so demonic, demonic influence on the church is, is not going to be uh, you don't you don't see you don't see like um, I can't think of a single instance. I mean, you, basically, I can think of Genesis six and this passage describing that this happened in fact in a past tense type of fashion. And then there's in a special place an abyss where they're locked up and waiting for for their own eternal judgment. Um, but you read the rest of the scriptures. You read First Peter and you read um, um, First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians. You know, an angel of light. Satan disguises himself like an angel of light. And so you have a messenger from Satan who is plaguing Paul because this in messenger, messenger means his angel, an angelos in Greek, an angelos that's, that's become a thorn in his flesh in his relationship to this Corinthian church. It's because of demonic influence that's affecting their, their morality and their doctrine. And so that's, that's, the, that's the emphasis in the New Testament on demonic activity. So, so hopefully that's helpful, just thinking about what, what they're out to do. You know, demons aren't successful if they just harm you, give you a flat tire, scare you. I mean, it's like demons are successful when they sneak into the church un unknown, unidentified, and they can start putting fleshly, carnal thoughts in the minds of believers. That's how demons are going to be really do their work among the church. So they, they, get, they get nothing out of scaring people. They, they love to lie and murder and condemn and deceive. And they want to confuse Christians. Uh, just to tease this out a little bit, um, Zach Can will be preaching uh, from Genesis 6 over the next couple of Sunday mornings. And uh, it's Noah, the Flood, and the Gospel. Is that the title? I think it's going to be God at the End of the World. God at the End of the World. Um, subtitle, I'm explaining what the demons were doing in Genesis 6. <laughs> no? Are you going to cover that, Zach? Uh, I, I will touch on it. It'll be one paragraph. Okay. So Zach's going to give one paragraph explanation. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, a couple of things are, are clear. In the Genesis 6 episode, when you read it, um, there's an explanation from the narrator that Nephilim are on the earth as a result of what was going on. And, and it's said in the past tense as if, um, you know, I need to explain how the Nephilim got here. What you find when you get to Jude 5 and following is that this isn't happening anymore. And I think the disincentive for the demons is they got locked up. They're, they're, they're bound until final judgment. Um, in other words, the, what was going on in Genesis 6 that was so reprehensible. And by the way, when you read um, Genesis 6, uh, 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, that is after the flood when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those are the mighty men of renown. Um, at some point in history, all we have there are the bare statement of facts of what happened narrated to us. Um, and then God turned that off, disallowed it. And so uh, John's point is, is right on. The, the, that is not a, a statement that we um, need to look out for demons doing some of the same things they did in some historical event. Um, but the, but the subtle things. In fact, what came to mind, John, as you were talking was just the statement in 1 Timothy um, chapter 5 um, where satanic influence had infiltrated the women's ministry at Ephesus. Um, you have this really remarkably shocking statement. Um, look at 1 Timothy 5. 
And, and this is the list of um, instructions for widows. When do you put widows on the list for particular care in the church? Um, only if they've lived this way and they've done these things. There's an extensive uh, list of qualifications for how the church is to help particular widows. And then in verse uh, 14, therefore, I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. This right after verse 13, some go around being idle, uh, busybodies and gossips, talking about things not worthy of mention. And then verse 15 is this explanatory. Why should younger widows get married and keep house? For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. That's just shocking. I mean, you're reading about the church with the pedigree. You're talking about Ephesus, Acts 20 and the Ephesian elders. You're talking about men who pastored that church like Paul himself and Timothy and eventually the apostle John most likely. Um, and, and yet what do you have infiltrating that church? Satan's work. And, and Satan doesn't come with the red horns and the Genesis 6 plot. Um, it's much more subtle and insidious because it sounds like truth and looks like light. And, and that is the real danger. And don't think for a moment that Satan and his henchmen are not interested in church. They're probably far more interested in church than many of us are at times. Uh, interested in infiltrating and destroying. So uh, that, that really is the, the subtle um, and insidious danger. Thanks, Dana, for the can of worms. And Zach can plow through that on Sunday morning. Carla has a question. You saw that hand. Should I start a podcast? <laughs> That's not my question. Um, but sure, yeah, you, I think that'd be great. Um, I'll just answer now. Okay, so my question actually is three questions. Um, does religious, the fight for religious freedom, or really any freedom, um, is it ever at odds with Romans 13 and us needing to submit to governing authorities? As a church member, how do I discern that? And what do you think about like members of GBC becoming politically active and like running for office or even doing things that are uh, with, within the law that uh, allowing us to be politically active? I'll, uh, I'll read this portion of Romans 13 and John can explain it and how it applies to your question, Carla. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For the rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing, Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, John, if we fill in the, that it pronoun with a representative republic and a constitutional democracy that is our American experiment that is kind of going away, um, what is a Christian's response when maybe things that we've appreciated and enjoyed are slipping away? What means do we have to fly the flag and be Americans um, and honor the Lord. Um, what, are, what are some principles and some lines to draw for us there? Yeah, and that's, this, is a, this is a, I mean, we could probably spend the rest of the evening talking about this question because this is so pertinent to where we live. Um, to start answering that question kind of requires some, some buildup. There's almost like, there's, there's some things that we want to make sure that we're, we're clear on. When, when I'm, as I'm hearing a lot of the conversation about the church's response to civil government. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been increasingly impressed with some of the fear that I hear um, from some Christians who, uh, which I understand, you know, the fear as grandparents, what kind of society are your grandkids gonna grow up in? 
as a dad, what kind of culture are my kids going to grow up in? Um, when, my, when my kids are my age, can a pastor preach Romans 1 without getting thrown in jail? Can we preach Romans 1 next year without <laughs> getting thrown in jail? I mean, so you're asking, we're asking very pertinent questions. And it starts tugging at a lot of desires. There's a lot of desires, a lot of, um, I mean, for us, for us who have been American, um, I, that's all I've ever been is an American. And from a fairly patriotic family, uh, two, two uncles who fought in World War II, one uncle lost in Vietnam. Um, and so when I think about America and I think about the, 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 the blessings of this country, um, that starts to tug at my heartstrings. And I, I have a profound appreciation for that. And so when you have all of these, and I'm just kind of giving you some background as I start thinking about Romans 13, some of the temptations that would even face us before we even get to the words on the page, how do we apply this text? We gotta realize that there's gonna be some strong things in our own hearts depending on our, on our backgrounds. Um, and there's also a reason why, you know, um, Christians in Uzbekistan aren't having this kind of question. Uh, first of all, they're not having Q&A because they, <laughs> they gotta hide in the woods or whatever. But the secondly, the reason why they, they wouldn't ask this question. Um, we're, we're only asking this question, not because we're Christians, but because we're American. So that's actually really helpful to start with. Like, we are asking the question, the question isn't what do we do as Christians, because where Christianity is illegal, they're just trying to stay alive and just be, glorify Christ. Whereas, we're actually asking a question, like, as an American, what right do I have? What role, should, how active should I be? Am I, am I disobeying Romans 13 if I try to make a change, if I try to preserve what we have, if I try to protect what, what we have and what we have had so far? And so that's really, that's, that's much more of an American question than it is even a, a Christian question. Because when it comes to the, the Christian question, Romans 13 couldn't be more clear. You submit to the secular government, you submit. You submit to, to who? I mean, does Paul even know what we're dealing with here? Uh, no, he doesn't. He actually was talking about Nero. Um, you know, so just read Suetonius, Life of the Twelve Caesars, and just do that. Put that by your nightstand. Read the, read the chapter on Nero, and you will be like, man, this government we got is not too bad. <laughs> we got it pretty easy. <laughs> we got it made. Um, we are not under a dictatorship, and the dictator is not named Nero. And so... He's not sitting there saying, like when he writes Romans 13, and you know, you heard, you heard Smed say it, uh, the government is supposed to be a ministry of re the rewards, um, re you know, justice to those who do what's right and repays evil for those who do, do evil. When he's describing the ideal of government, he is not giving the Christian the criteria to make an independent judgment whether I will submit or not. So I've heard so many people look at Romans 13 and say, Oh, well, see, yeah, it says it's supposed to be a reward for good, but, you know, well, they didn't reward me, and uh, this guy did bad, and they didn't punish him, and so they're not my government. And it's like suddenly what, what Paul describes is, look, here's the whole point of government, and that's why you should submit. That, if that becomes an excuse for not doing what they say, then we incur the consequence because we were just plain rebellious. And God gets no glory from that. So Romans 13 couldn't be any more clear, and we just got to make sure that uh, we don't turn that phrase into a criteria where we start making judgments about, I get to choose when I submit or not. Um, I think what becomes really interesting in this whole discussion is on the side of um, activism and going against the government. I mean, we, we have, and I, don't, I need to wrap this up here because I feel like I'm monologuing now, but um, I do think it's important to rem kind of recognize where we're at as a country. I mean, we're, we're we're just, we're young bucks on the, on, in world history. We think about our country and you know, it's like, oh man, America has been around forever. Uh, no, it's just a couple hundred years. And you look back, you know, pre-76, pre-1776, and you look at like the loyalists and you look at those, the revolutionaries, and you look at what, what happens. It's interesting, I had a, I had a history class um, on, the, on the history of the American pulpit and we just studied the sermons that happened um, before the revolution, we studied the sermons that were happening in the Civil War, we studied the sermons that were happening in the Civil Rights era, during the Social Gospel Movement. We just started reading on both sides of that issue, and it was a fascinating piece because you have people butchering the same text, just making their point all over the place. And so we come from a country where we kind of are, it's in our DNA in, in one degree, that if 
we don't get the kind of government that we want, then we rebel. I mean, that's how we started as a country. You know, so if you think about the nature of, of what, what, what was the argument for a revolutionary, a revolutionary would say, look, we, we don't have the rights that we ought to have. We should be able to have representation, and we don't. We're still in colony status. Or even, even legitimate uh, concerns, like uh, in, injustices are being uh, perpetrated against our family members by the militia. Well, of course, protect your, protect your daughters. A dad protecting his daughter, that's just a God-given obligation. I got just what you do. But that still doesn't mean that you would commit a coup against your secular government and take up arms as, a, as some sort of Christian action. Um, it's, it's just in our DNA to rebel. And so the question then becomes, so, so what do we do? How, do we have any recourse? And, and we do as Americans. And I think this is where it becomes really important is that before we even talk about recourse that we're firmly planted where the scriptures put us, um, if, if the argument, and here's, I'm going I'm to kind of appeal to an argument that's popular. I haven't heard this so much. I don't think I've heard this in this church, but it's popular among a lot of um, uh, on-mill and post-mill worldviews, the idea of the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. The doctrine of the lesser magistrates would be the idea that lesser lesser ranking authorities are supposed to hold the higher ranking authorities to account. And so if a government, like in our structure, in a constitutional republic, might be the best way to put it, constitutional republic, we have elected officials who represent us, well, the lesser ranking officials should be able to hold them to an account. And if they don't, then we just, you know, we're gonna, we, we have recourse to, to check tyranny. And that's kind of like how you, how you check tyranny. So I, I read a book by Matthew Trujillo on the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. And it was interesting, I opened up the book, Preface starts with a, a, an appeal to Kent Hovind, who was a, a, a Christian creationist, right? Who uh, taught uh, taught six-day little creation, stopped paying his taxes, and gets thrown in jail. And so, in his rebellion against tyranny, he kind of became the martyr of the doctrine of the lesser magistrates movement uh, because he never paid his taxes. And so, then for um, tax fraud, for tax evasion, sorry, he um, he, he goes and serves time. Here, here's the question that you, would, you have to ask. If you're going to think about going against government simply because they are unjust, if it's an unjust government, should I go against it? What should I do? I have an example in my Lord, Jesus Christ. So think about P, th 1 Peter chapter 2. He says this, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and the praise of those who do right. Such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Very similar to Romans, what, Paul, what uh, Smith just read from Paul. So Peter goes on to say, um, I'm going to skip down to verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor is any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And so, the part, that's Paul, Christ's example in verses 21 to 23. You go back to the paragraph that I skipped. He says, submit to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if, for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under suffering when suffering unjustly. If, if our job as Christians is to rebel against government when they act in an unjust manner, Christ would never have gone to the cross. I mean, in my book, it's like, end of story. Like, it's like, there's our example. I don't, I don't really know how you would get around that. At the same time, as Americans, there's, a, there's also an, on, an honest question that we can answer. Is everything that's being called my government, my government? And that becomes a little bit more complicated. But that's also an honest question. The, the, but to start with, you've got to just say, look, our government is what it is, and we have the privilege of submitting. Until they tell us to d disobey scripture, we submit to government. 
when, t when, when somebody starts to make, if somebody just rises up because they have a bunch of friends and they're all armed and they just say, hey, I'm the dictator here and you need to do this, you know, you might say, no, you don't have the right to do that. So we have, as an American, we have legal recourse and we have things that we can do as, regardless, you know, a Christian, but an American citizen, we have legal recourse that we can pursue. And so activism is not wrong unless it's outlawed, unless it's doing something violent, unless it's doing something slanderous, unless it's doing something that does not honor the Lord. Um, can we go to court? Yeah, we have court system. We have all sorts of recourse that we can use if there's been an, a violation of, of what's been prescribed as our government. So, you know, hostile takeover is there's a legitimate tyranny that, you know, should be, should be resisted, not because we're being in, insubordinate to government, because it's, it's not government. So that gets really complicated if we start talking about when an executive order becomes government and versus going through legislation. That starts to get that starts to get above my pay grade. But I just want to say that it's it's super it's cl super clarifying to start with scripture where it just says this: if you submit to your government until they tell you to disobey the scriptures, which is Acts five, and that's obviously what the apostles did. So. And the real danger to the soul, personally, is you logic yourself the way Kent Hovind did. Um, and you find yourself with Spiro Agnew and Al Capone, uh, you know, dinged for income tax evasion. And, and you've got a clear text that say, pay taxes to whom taxes are due. And you find yourself not only compromising what you can do with scripture as an individual, but tarnishing the reputation of what it means to be under scripture as a Christian before a watching world. And that's the real danger to the individual soul and to gospel witness. And, and you hear this argument about the lesser magistrate, and, and books have been written, ink has been spilled over it. But if you go back to the source of the lesser magistrate argument, it is from John Calvin in his Institutes, and it is literally two paragraphs long. And Calvin's original argument on the lesser magistrate is simply, if you're in a, 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 a bureaucratic level of government, you cannot get off the hook before God in your accountability before God as, a, as an instrument of God for service to humanity if the guy above you is telling you to do something immoral, something that displeases God. You don't get off the hook by obeying orders. The lesser magistrate must do what is right before the Lord and try to make appeal up the ladder in government. And if it doesn't go anywhere, you take your lumps. That was Calvin's argument. And that gets used by everybody who wants to drive a truck through that argument and say, oh, lesser magistrate, there's a lesser magistrate. I'm gonna pick who I wanna obey. And you hear a lot, a lot of American theologians talking that way right now. And it is a dishonor to the lesser magistrate argument, which was actually holding Christians accountable to be pleasing to the Lord and whatever the cost. And it's being used as a, I just want to be a rebel rouser and have theological cover. Um, and what a tragedy that is. And what a contrast. And John, you mentioned Acts 5. I just want to read this. Um, you, you know the scene. They, they were preaching. They were told not to preach. We must obey God rather than men. Um, and then Gamaliel gives this counsel and, and says, don't touch these guys. If they're from God, you're not going to be able to stop it. And you just think, oh, great, they're going to get off scot-free. What, what do they do with them when they let them go? They beat them <laughs> and then let them go. Okay, Gamaliel, yeah, we won't touch these guys after we beat them up. And, and, then, and then they leave. They went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching. Um, what a remarkable scene. And, and what a great thing to, for Christians to be known for. Um, not start a revolution so we can freely preach the gospel, but preach the gospel and take your lumps. I mean, if you are going to disobey men in order to obey God, we shouldn't assume that we escape the consequences that men dole out. And Romans 13 is a comfort. The flip side of the coin in Romans 13 is a comfort is that every government official who has ever lived is an instrument in God's hands intended for the goodness and service of humanity to keep us from being as bad as we possibly could as a mass of evil people. It, it's, it's a check on total depravity and universal depravity getting us into a heap of trouble. Um, what a kindness of God for that sword, but every man who wields it will be accountable to God at judgment for the way he wielded it. That's a comfort for me in suffering. Um, that, that ought to let us pray as Stephen prayed, as his Lord prayed, forgive them, as they're throwing rocks at you while you go unconscious. I mean, that, that's the ideal way to suffer as a Christian. And, and Omri's been pointing out in his uh, Blood for Clarity series in Equipping Hour 
you don't always get to pick what you go down for. Um, but, but you stand on the truth of God's word. And, and they might put you in jail. And never forget being in Russia and asking uh, in a church in Moscow, Second Baptist, I think it was, um, and asking, where, where are all the men in the church? There were, there were no males over 30 years old. A bunch of old women uh, and then some young people. But where are the old men? And, and we were told, well, uh, the pastor got hauled off one day and nobody ever saw him again. So the associate pastor preached the next couple Sundays and then he disappeared. And then the deacons all took their turn and eventually the church was emptied of its men because they all preached and they all disappeared under communism. Um, communism, see, now that's a rabbit trail. <laughs> How does it, can Carla Walker run for governor of the state of Arizona? Is, I want to I go back to her question, John. Is it legitimate for a Christian to hold political office? Uh, absolutely. Uh, possible? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, I, I, it's absolutely uh, legitimate. I mean, so there's nothing um, uh, until, until you would have to do something that would dishonor the Lord. Um, if, if I were, you know, I had somebody ask me one time, uh, this was back when I was in Florida. They said, said John, why, aren't, why don't you spend your time protesting abortion down in Tallahassee? Why don't you go to the state capitol and take on abortion? And I said, well, I said, you know, if I were a politician, uh, that would be a totally worthwhile task because I firmly believe that would make the existence, the quality of life here, it's better for, it's better for, God would be pleased with that. It would be better for society. Um, and so you better believe that's what I would be pushing for, lobbying for if I were in state legislation. I said, but I'm a pastor. And so I started to explain to this person, I said, look, I've had, I, I, I had somebody come into my office the day before an abortion. And by God's grace, here we are five years later, and that child is now being raised to fear the Lord in this church. You know, you think, would I give that up to change legislation? I mean, yeah, that's better legislation. It's better for America. But if we overturn Roe v. Wade, how many people does that put in the kingdom? It's just like, it's, it was a, dis, it's a distraction for me as a Christian. So when you start thinking about the question of, okay, Christian responsibility, can, can a Christian run for office? Absolutely. Is that because it's their Christian mission? No. No. Christian, a Christian who happens to be in politics is no different than a Christian who happens to be in medicine, than a Christian who happens to be in transportation, than a Christian who happens to be an engineer. It's to glorify God in that calling, glorify, share the gospel, live such a brilliant life for Christ that they see your good deeds and, and rejoice, and then your responsibility would be passing legislation. But... It's just no, it's no different. And, I, and I, my, my concern is not that people would be in or out of politics. My concern is when that starts to become the mission of the church, that's when the gospel gets lost. And that's when the church starts to become weakened, is when this is what the pastors ought to be doing. This is, what, this is the Christian mission, is making America a better place. Um, we, we could try to make, we could try to increase human flourishing as a church and squander our entire purpose of existence. I mean, if you want to see human flourishing, just watch what happens when Christ comes back. Humans are going to flourish. I just got distracted with the slogan you said a second ago. Did you just say, make America build back better again? Or something like that? <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't going for a slogan. but uh, Okay, you were saying something way more important than what I was thinking I about. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. I'll go with what Smith said. I don't even know what I said, so. That's what was much better. So yeah, that's all my, that's my biggest concern is just uh, the church getting distracted from the Great Commission. And, and that should be what motivates our Christian politicians and every other uh, occupation. Um, what about using, we, we have Paul the Apostle using means under the Roman Empire, for instance, uh, appealing to Caesar, um, ultimately in God's purpose to get him to Rome. What do you think about Christians using uh, the various means in, available to us as Americans um, to, to change a political agenda, to fight the encroaching 
whatever political ideas we don't like. Yeah, no, there's there's nothing wrong with that. Like if, if the if you have an opportunity that you think this would be what would please the Lord to be a good citizen for the benefit of my country, that's great. I had a friend ask me who his his job was. Um, he was in a um, kind of a grassroots national level movement um, that's trying to uh, it's trying to assemble a convention of states. It's the only uh, it's it's one of the ways we can pass an amendment. Constitutionally, we've never done it before. We've always done it at the federal level. So they're trying to do the grassroots level. If the majority of the states um, sign up for a convention of states, then they can actually pass an amendment kind of in a backhanded way, an underhanded way. So they're working at that. And so he called me up and he said, hey, can, can I be a part of a protest? Like, my job is asking me to be a part of the protest because he's at the national level. That's his, that's his job, his salary. And so, and so I just said, well, you got to ask, what's this protest involve? And does it involve violence? Does it involve slander? Does it involve defamation, does it involve anything dishonest, anything the Lord wouldn't, no, 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 well then great, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, it's just, it's just, that's fine. Um, my, my concern again would just be to caution you to think about the, the, if you do that, don't let your mind go down the road of thinking, this is advancing Christianity. Because when that happens, we start thinking that, man, we can actually make Christianity popular. Because the world would love a Christianity that did not preach a gospel but made the world a better place, that cleaned up the streets, removed graffiti, increased um, the, the gross national product, and made the, the quality of living better. Boy, that's the kind of Christianity that everybody wants. The Christless Christianity with all of the economic benefits. And so, you know, there's just too much happening in the name of Christian church right now that is, is really compromised in that area. And, and it really is, it looks like a popularity contest with unbelievers as they're trying to uh, change legislation. Yeah, and it's interesting. Arizona, it, we, we kind of have the uh, kind of renegade reputation. We have a whole mix of different kinds of political entities and, and uh, ideas uh, in the mix here. Um, and it is really critical for Christians to, to identify very clearly uh, the difference between living here for now and being a good citizen in a way that pleases the Lord um, fighting for ideas that are better than other ideas, but also recognizing, uh, Rich Mullins said it well, I'll, I'll call this land my country, but it is not my home. Um, where is home for the Christian? It's the same home that the Uzbeki Christian has. Uh, Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. And that, that little nugget was written to Christians at Philippi that was a, a Roman colony that uh, had Roman citizenship for the citizens resident of that city. It was highly prized to have that citizenship, special status. And yet Paul addressed them and said, our citizenship is in heaven. Um, and we just have to keep that in mind. This, this country is a blip on the historical radar. Um, and, and it's not forever, no promises for it to last. It's, it's a blessing to live here in many ways. Um, it's a distraction to live here in many ways too. Christians have to fight for it. And so to, to use the the polite phrase when you see the, the flags flying that say, let's go, Brandon. Um, Christians cannot be associated with that stuff. Um, and if you don't know what I mean, don't worry about it. Uh, um, it's just, it's, it's critical that our loyalties are Christward and our home is heaven. Um, and, and we're asking the question, if that's our foundational identity, um, how can I serve the place where I live well? Similar to the instructions for Israelites in uh, Babylonian captivity, live there and serve well and you'll prosper. That's great. Uh, there's an encouragement there for Americans, but we're sojourning. This isn't home. So thanks, John. Appreciate that. Carla, thanks for the question. And for all those of you who have uh, more questions, dogpiling on Carla's or other questions in your mind, we're going to do this about once a quarter. So uh, stockpile those questions, wait about 12 weeks, and, uh, and we'll do this again. Um, I'll close us in prayer. Lord, thanks for tonight, and thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the precision with which things that you have written uh, really address us uh, 2,000 years after they were penned, uh, because they are your words. You know the heart of man. Uh, there is nothing new under the sun, and you have given us truth. Uh, really is an anchor for how we address all of life. Thank you so much for this body of believers. We pray that truly we would be prepared for whatever persecution may come. 
We pray that we would be those who uh, seek to please you, that our fundamental desire as citizens of heaven would be to reflect heaven's priorities everywhere we go, uh, that the flag we fly would be loyalty and fidelity to you most of all. And I pray for this country. We pray for the leaders of this country, uh, the ones whom you will hold accountable for the way that they steward their responsibilities. Um, God, we pray for salvation. We pray for forgiveness of sin for those who have such weighty responsibilities. We pray that they would do what is right. We pray that they would serve their citizenry well. And God, we pray that whatever they do, we would honor you in all things. Would you be pleased to use uh, believers in strategic positions to accomplish your purposes, even for temporal things? But most of all, Lord, let us be pleasing to you with an eternal perspective and a, a homesickness for heaven uh, where righteousness dwells. We long to be there and to take as many people as we can with us. Uh, we ask for that for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.